it's a pleasure sitting across from you on stage after interning at the Gates Foundation this past summer. Um, so I wanna spend some time today talking a little bit about the values and decisions that have really shaped where you are today, as well as hear a, a little bit of your thoughts around where you are going, as well as where the Gates Foundation is going. Sounds good, I'm glad to be here. Great. So let's start off um, by talking about uh, two of the really big pillars that have been constant in your career, healthcare and education. And in fact, your father was a pharmacist and your mother was a teacher. So I'm interested to hear a little bit about how, what kinds of lessons they taught you and how have those lessons really shaped uh, the way you thought about your career? Okay. As you all just heard, um, I grew up in Reno, Nevada, biggest little city in the world. And uh, although I'm a California native, so now that I'm in Seattle, by the way, I'm getting all sorts of grief about Kaepernick. Uh, <laughs> a lot of trash talk up there. But, but, but I, I feel like today and my entire career um, has been so heavily shaped by how I was raised. I'm one of seven kids and um, number two of seven. And from a very early age, there, was, there were a couple things that, that I got from my parents that stay with me today. Um, one is just a, a, a fierce love of reading and learning from my mom, who was an English teacher, um, and, and a sense of the privilege it is to be involved in health from my dad, who's a pharmacist and being able to work in my dad's drugstore when I was young and seeing how my dad was so focused on people who were suffering or sick and trying to make them better um, made a big impact on my wish to see if I could do something to contribute in medicine. And you've made a lot of really unorthodox decisions in your career. Um, first, going to Uganda in the late 1980s to study HIV AIDS at a time where not very much was known about the disease, and later leaving the number one pharmaceutical company to go to what was a relatively new and struggling biotech company, um, Genentech. Not a lot of people would take those kinds of risks. So tell me a little bit about what you were looking for at those times. How were you weighing the benefits versus the costs of those decisions? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, I actually learned a lot of lessons, um, both about leadership and about risk taking from both of those um, opportunities. So I had been at, at UCSF for seven years when the Rockefeller Foundation uh, came to UCSF and asked UCSF to study heterosexual transmission of HIV. It's hard to remember now, but at the time in 1988, it, uh, AIDS was thought to be a disease related to either being uh, gay or having a blood product. Um, and it, there was a myth then that in fact, there was this um, secret homosexuality going on in Africa. And that must have been why that people were too embarrassed to confess that they were gay, but that, that heterosexual transmission of HIV was probably a myth. And so when Rockefeller um, came to UCSF, UCSF asked me and my um, then husband, who's an infectious disease doctor, to move to uh, Kampala to work in Uganda. And, and I have a very distinctive memory of one of my uh, dear colleagues, Bob Cohen, telling me that I would ruin my ap academic career by moving to Uganda. And it was really good advice. Um, and in fact, <laughs> it was actually, a, it, it was good advice because he was right. Mm. Um, for two years, I didn't publish. Mm. Uh, I didn't schmooze or interact or do things you do to become a tenure track faculty member. And um, when we came back from Uganda, which was a completely life-changing experience in every way, um, there, there were two things that stayed with me. One is that my academic career was over and I needed to leave and figure out how to pay the rent and, and make a living. And two, that I would never be the same. And that my own expectations of myself, um, all the privilege I had had my whole life, and what I expected from myself as a leader and as somebody who, who was so fortunate to have education and clean water and great parents and a great family and a wonderful husband um, that I needed to give back and I needed to do something. Um, I will tell you when I became chancellor at UCSF, 
I called up Bob, <laughs> and I said, hey, Bob, I made Guess it back. <laughs> it's like it worked out all right. <laughs> I just skipped that whole associate professor thing. <laughs> So that was that was uh, a huge risk, mm -hmm. especially to my uh, burgeoning academic career, um, but a really good risk. Um, so that later when I was at Bristol Myers Squibb and I was working on Taxol, which was their number one cancer drug and a terrific new advance in chemotherapy, um, I visited Genentech and that was in, in 95 and Art Levinson was the head of R&D, and Art talked to me about Genentech's wish to be a cancer company, but Genentech had no marketed products that were cancer drugs. Um, but they had terrific science, a, an incredible vision that Art had that they would lead in cancer, and that Genentech would transform how people were treated who had cancer. And I was so deeply inspired by that vision um, that I thought, well, you know, nothing may come of this, but I want to be part of that. Uh, and having had the experience of taking a risk before and knowing that the consequences of not taking that risk and not seeing what might be possible wasn't acceptable to me. Uh, and, and so that, that career risk taking um, seemed, seemed totally reasonable which is probably why I'm not at UCSF anymore. I'm in the, at the Gates Foundation. And you mentioned Art Levinson, um, who hired you, really helped to catapult your career as an executive at Genentech. Art has said that when you first got there, you were a little bit soft. You needed to learn how to make tough decisions. Do you agree with that assessment? <laughs> and if so, how did you develop that ability? Yeah, it depends on your definition of soft. Sure. <laughs> So Art, Art uh, um, was my boss for most of the 14 years I was at Genentech, and we remain really close friends and colleagues, uh, which I think is, is um, one of those special things that I hope that all of you in your careers get to experience. The combination of a boss who is so inspiring and so driven and passionate about having a successful company and making a difference for patients, and sometimes so deeply annoying. Um, <laughs> and, and there were two things annoying about art for me that I grew to be really fond of. One was him pushing me, that I should be tough on, on everything, that, that um, as driven as I am and as I was, it was okay to be demanding of others in service of what we were trying to accomplish, that I shouldn't be embarrassed about that or think that people would think I'm mean or too tough. Um, and so I do think there was sort of a toughness factor uh, and not being afraid of asking people to overachieve in service of what we were trying to do that I learned from art. Um, but the other thing and a really special thing that I push myself to think about all the time is I got from art that he really felt like I consistently underestimated myself. And in, in the best of ways, he would demonstrate to me that he was going to keep raising the bar for what he wanted from me or what he expected from me. And yet he was completely confident I was up to it, even when I wasn't. And as a leader and as somebody who mentors or manages other people, that sense that it, it isn't being nice to them to underestimate them or be easy on, on them, but to say, I'll bet you're capable of more. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm going to ask you hard things, but you're up to it. That was a really special thing to have a boss like that. I'm very grateful for that. What do, you, what do you think it's like to work for you at this point? So art was a tremendous influence, but you know, I'm, in, I'm interested to know. I think, you know, how, would you, how do you think the people who work for you describe your leadership? Gosh, uh, can I make up something really great? And <laughs> <laughs> so, then hope they'll live up to that. that. Yeah. <laughs> the, I, well, I'll tell you what I hope they would, they would feel. Um, it, when I get excited about things, I'm all in. You know, and, and I'm, um, I've been so incredibly lucky to be involved with things from trying to change the way cancer is treated to creating a great university 
to literally changing the world through our work at the foundation, I hope that what people who I work with would say about me is I'm fierce and demanding and, um, and sincere in my wish that we make a big difference. Um, and what I want it to be like when I'm leading is both fun and exhausting. Um, because I, I honestly think it's, um, you don't get great things without trying hard. And you know, this room's filled with people who are overachievers. I know that about you. And so many overachievers um, feel like, oh my God, you know, I need more work-life balance or I need to be easier on myself or I need to get more sleep. But there's something really special about being fierce when you're doing something important or you want to create something special. And, and I hope that, that when I'm at my best, I'm fierce. I know you've said before carpe diem is, is something that you really believe in. So it's interesting to hear how that plays out in your leadership philosophy. Um, you know, Sue, I think one of the interesting things about your career is that you've spent time both on the commercial sector side and in the, the not-for-profit education as well as now the philanthropic sector. Uh, what do you think the lessons are that you took from your time on the corporate side to UCSF when you went there um, as chancellor? Huge recession, budget cuts across the state. What were the biggest things that you were thinking about and how did you take your perspective, your very unique perspective, and use it to make change? Well, I, I think the, the, the experience I had had in the corporate sector was helpful to me in moving to UCSF and now to the foundation in a couple of ways. <clears throat> One is, and it's something I like a lot about um, the for-profit publicly traded company world, there's a certain orderliness and set of expectations that come regularly. Once a quarter, you have to tell the whole world how you're doing. And you have to do so with metrics that are widely understood, earnings per share, uh, sales, if you're in product development, number of approvals, product launches, do people like your products, are they using them? And I think particularly when you're in science and when you're in the R&D world, it can be easy to continue to push the finish line forward and, and to, to put off accountability. And so I think first and foremost, the commercial world um, resonated for me in a very high accountability metrics oriented way. And so bringing that model of high accountability and using metrics to the academic world was important to me and served me well. The other aspect of, of the private world that, um, that I brought to UCSF and already was at UCSF, but I probably expanded, is the wish to have effective public-private partnerships, um, but to be realistic about them. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I think one of the most efficient ways for people to lead is to be really clear about what you're asking of people and what the outcomes are. Too often in academia, um, we would be approaching private companies and somehow out of fear of rejection, I think, we would be unclear. We would be asking for charity, like could you write us a check because you care about UCSF and we're going through a tough time, but we would pretend it's a business deal. And I would often talk to faculty members about these, these public-private partnerships and push ourselves first, but then the companies as well, is this part of your business plan? Are we part of your business plan? Because that's called a deal. What do you need? What do we need? What, what money exchanges hands? What are the expectations? Or do you have a charitable part of what you're doing that you'd like to give us a check and we'll thank you and, and be grateful? Um, those are really different things. And the consequences of misunderstanding the difference between a deal and charity are high. And so partly because I had come from the private sector, understanding what a head of R&D or a head of a company is looking for for their company and what UCSF needed and was looking for for us as a public institution, hopefully there'd be some marriage, but if there wasn't, it was better not to even start. 
One of the uh, more controversial proposals that you had at UCSF was um, potentially separating some of the operations and finances of the UCSF campus from the UC system. That didn't end up coming to fruition. And I'm curious to know, is there anything that you learned from putting that proposal out there and having it in some senses fail um, in the way that you didn't intend? What could you have done differently, if anything? Yeah, I think that, that I learned a lot of lessons for, from that. Um, one is, I think it's um, uh, in service of the university being a great institution, I, I'll tell you what I feel good about. I feel good about pushing, pushing really hard that anything I could do to serve the governance of UCSF in a positive way and leverage all the assets that UCSF had and has in service of being the best institution we could possibly be for California and for the world is something I was very motivated by and driven by in my quest to increase the independence of UCSF on the governance front. Where I think I probably underestimated is the passion with which the regents um, look at the whole of the 10 universities of California as, as one. And although I thought it was pretty low risk for them to take a graduate student only, life sciences only, am I selling you? <laughs> <laughs> as an experiment, one time only, low <laughs> consequence. Um, <laughs> I think I underestimated two things. One is the history and the passion with which people care about the unified UC system. And the other thing is how quickly my colleagues, especially at Berkeley, wanted to go with me. And so <laughs> me positioning this as a one-time experiment, only UCSF as Berkeley was kind of latching on and, and coming along, uh, it kind of made it seem like a sham that this was a one-time small experiment. Um, and, and so I learned a lot from that. And I also learned about the importance of, of not going so fast that you kind of hit a wall. But um, you know, at the Gates Foundation, we have this saying that we're impatient optimists. My impatience may have gotten uh, the best of me because <laughs> I wanted it now. Uh, and, um, and my optimism probably got the best of me too in thinking that people would go along. On the other hand, um, my successor, uh, Chancellor Hoggood, continues to reap the benefits of the region's understanding better the business model of UCSF, how UCSF operates, how an academic medical center um, receives funds, and the importance of being nimble in today's world of healthcare. And so I hope that the institution and, and Chancellor Hoggood continue to reap the benefits of leaning out maybe a little ahead of my skis. <laughs> as, a, as a biotech executive, really responsible for the R&D side of things, um, you really have to become very comfortable with the risk of failure very early on and think about the portfolio and how you're gonna manage that appropriately. How do you as a leader think about treating failure and taking risks and how do you sort of let that viewpoint trickle down within your organization? The, the risk of failure for me is something that is a part of being an innovator. I don't think you can do um, excellent innovation without um, failing and, and failing serially sometimes. Um, but, but I think that there's, there's a couple of ways that I thought about that and I continue to think about that. I think it's a key part of leadership to have an environment that accepts failure and welcomes failure um, and encourages people to take risk. Um, but I mentioned before how, how accountability is really important to me. And so one of the things I think uh, in any venture when you have a portfolio of projects and I had a portfolio of projects at Genentech and I have a portfolio of projects at the foundation that we oversee. No institution can fail serially and succeed. And so um, what, what I would always ask of people and, and especially in the clinical trials world, so that pertains to the things we're doing in global health, but, but even more broadly, our job as innovators is to seek truth. And if you're making a new product for human beings, truth might be that that product is neither safe nor effective. What the company needed from us, and actually what the world needs from us now, is clear answers that we believe. 
sometimes the answer is no. And so the job of people who are innovators is to quickly and efficiently get a clear answer that we believe. And so I tried to set an environment where I rewarded clear, efficient answers. And I particularly aw awarded in the face of human health if the answer is this is unsafe, this isn't good for patients, or there's a better drug that somebody else has and it's not gonna be us, if you reward and celebrate the people who get to that answer, good things happen. If you, if you expect the answer is always yes, or that people have projects that always succeed, you start playing small ball, you have small incremental progress, if any progress at all, and if people find an answer that's a no, they don't want to tell you that. And so part of the most important part of leading an innovative environment for me is enabling people to seek the truth and tell you the truth. I know you've had a chance to think a lot about seeking truth and how to create that kind of culture within an organization. Uh, at the Gates Foundation, which you joined last May. So it's been uh, not quite a year yet, but a lot has happened since then. And I'm curious, you know, now that you've had some time under your belt, what do you want your personal legacy at the Gates Foundation to be as it heads into its uh, you know, upcoming 15th year? I believe it's in its 15th year right now. So what do you want your legacy to be there? Well, it there's a few things that I care about most. Some of them are short term, but you're asking about legacy. It's not uncommon for people to remind me that I um, uh, am the CEO of the largest foundation in the world. Uh, and that's uh, um, interesting. Um, <laughs> big is good. We have scale. We can make important things happen. So in the, in the simplest of ways, I'd rather be known as the best foundation in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the foundation that, that made a really big difference, that made important things happen. And so what that means for me, it kind of breaks down into, if I want us to move from biggest to really that's, that's the foundation that if I have wealth, makes me want to be a philanthropist. If I can do a job, makes me want to work in the not-for-profit sector. Um, it, it, if I want to vote a certain way, it's to vote for the kind of policies that enable the work the foundation does. All of that means that the work we do at the foundation needs to take our investments, which in the bigger world, although we're the biggest foundation, are small versus government and, uh, uh, and other sectors, especially the private sector. That, that our work enables that transformation we want to have happen and that, that that's visible and meaningful um, and that we attract great talent because the culture of the foundation means that, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the Procter & Gamble board and it's really interesting to me that people like Scott Cook and Meg Whitman still talk about that early on their first job was at Procter & Gamble. I want people to say, you know, during my career, I was at the Gates Foundation. Every bit as much as Meg says, you know, I was a product manager at P&J. Because that means that's a special life-changing experience for that person. So I want to lead the organization that is that organization. What do you think are going to be the biggest challenges for you to get to that goal, which um, having worked at the Gates Foundation, I, I love and definitely adhere to. What are those challenges going to be and how are you mitigating them through your leadership? Well, I, I think there's challenges on two fronts. One is we have audacious ambitions. Um, you know, if, if I start running off the list, it makes me feel a little um, sweaty, you know. <laughs> it's just, it, it, solve polio, tackle malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, um, <clears throat> African sleeping sickness, um, improve lives for smallholder farmers, um, get 120 million more women on modern contraception by 2020. Oh, and fix the U.S. educational system while we're at it. Right. Uh, <laughs> that too. Um, so I, I think on the impact front, because we're tackling some of the world's hardest problems with metrics, we're really visibly pushing ourselves to make a huge difference. And so for me, being a great foundation starts with impact. And, and that impact requires us to be great collaborators. 
work with others towards these very important audacious goals. And so doing that effectively means it starts with the, the awareness we have of our place in the world. How can our capital serve as leverage, serve as a lubricant, be transformational? What are the unique things we can do as a foundation that others won't do? And on the culture side, it is hitting that sweet spot that I mentioned before. I, I always felt like my best days at work have come just in the perfect middle of feeling really comfortable and free and like I can do anything and totally terrified and, and being frozen. And, and so somewhere at the Gates Foundation, I want people to feel like, man, I can make anything happen. And we, we have just incredibly talented people who should feel that way. And it's a high wire act to pull off what we're trying to pull off. So can we just hit that middle? you know, where you're both terrified and excited. Making a culture for really talented people where it feels just right, exhilarated, not overwhelming, excited, and a little terrified, that kind of culture is special and wonderful and takes enormous energy every single day to live up to that. You're working with two of the most uh, engaged and smartest philanthropists that there are in the world, Bill and Melinda. I feel I have a responsibility to ask what so many of the audience are, are thinking. What's it like to work with them? And in particular, how have you had to adjust your leadership style in order to work effectively with this type of partnership? Well, I work at a family business. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> or as other uh, people in the uh, foundation world have told me, your donors are alive. <laughs> They're very alive, I can tell you, <laughs> happily. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it, I'm not sure how to answer your question. I, I, I learned a very important leadership lesson, in, and we talked about Art Levinson, and, and it, one of the most important things I learned from working with Art who came from R&D to being CEO. He did not adjust his personality to become the CEO. He was as goofy and as, as nerdy as he was when he was the head of research, when he became the CEO. And so I think great leaders, and I know leaders I admire, show up as themselves every day. And so when I approached being the CEO with Bill and Melinda, I knew there were two extraordinary special people. And I said, I'm just gonna be myself. And I'm gonna be myself through the whole interview process. And if that's embarrassing to them, or if I'm too weird, or you know, they don't like how I operate, then they'll figure it out during the interview process and they won't be surprised. Um, and so I had an interview with Bill that was funny because people had told me, boy, when he gets mad, you know, ugh, it's gonna be bad. So I thought, well, maybe I should test what it's like if he's mad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had read something about a criticism about the, the foundation's focus on polio eradication. You know, there's a lot of other problems in the world and we're spending too much. And so when I was interviewing with Bill, I said, so what do you think about all the criticism of the polio efforts? I thought, well, maybe that'll get him. You know, because I wanted to test what it would be like if he was fired up. And you know, he did react. <laughs> And then I realized there's a really big difference between getting him fired up and being mad and being mad at me, which that didn't really <laughs> test that well. Um, so happily, I haven't had that experience. Okay. Good. <laughs> but, but I would say I am so enjoying working with Bill and Melinda. They're very, very different from each other and very complimentary. And, and what they have in common is incredible, almost impossible to explain generosity. And the, the most sincere wish that their generosity and their foundation changes the world in positive ways. And that's real and fundamental and the reason I'm there. And, and Bill's impatience, doggedness, brilliance, um, and everything that Bill is and everything he's brought to the world, he's bringing to the work at the foundation is, is just magnificent. You know, it's just a really special, powerful thing. 
And Melinda's sense of social justice, her incredible caring for women and girls, she's like the world's best, most enthusiastic mom and brings all that to the job. And so on any given day, I get to work with Bill and Melinda or Bill or Melinda and tap into all the power and passion and intellect that both of them bring to the job. Um, and we have to get stuff done. And, uh, and that's their expectations. Um, the other thing I'm learning, which I think is just a really important thing, both in a family business, but in anything you do in life where you have co-chairs, um, they're not the same. They don't always agree. And so one of the most important things I can do is to point out where they're coming at something from two different places. And it's part of, of my background in science and technology. I think truth comes out of messiness. And I think that's an asset I bring to the foundation that if Bill and Melinda disagree or see things in different ways because of their different perspectives, I want to make that visible. I'm not afraid of that. In fact, I embrace that because my fundamental belief as a leader is the more disparate voices, it's for me a big part of diversity and why I like diversity is the more different views that come from very different places, it, really good outcomes will happen. We'll get a, a better answer or the best answer from that. So I'm trying to tap into that part of me and that affinity I have for differences to be um, a good partner for the two of them. I think uh, one more question before we turn it over to the audience for Q&A, but you have been able to balance that delicate intersection between having a successful career and also having a life of meaning. And that's a question I think a lot of us in the audience are trying to wrestle with right now is how do we have both of those things? What advice do you have to share with us about how we can think about our careers going forward? You know, it's, um one of the aspects of my life that we haven't talked about that's the most special to me is I'm a cancer doctor. So um, as a cancer doctor, you interact with people in a really special way. And that is often you have to tell people that they're gonna die faster than you hope and faster than they would wish for themselves. And I think in the, in the worst ways and the worst days that made me feel like a failure. Like I just couldn't, fix things that I wanted to fix. And the best outcome of that for me was what you talked about before, my own sense of carpe diem. You know, every day is precious. Every week is a great week that I get to have. And so I just really believe in having fun. If I'm in the middle of something hard, if I'm working, if I'm not at work, um, I want everything I experience to be meaningful and special. And I've not always been great at work-life balance but I'm really good at having fun. I don't believe in suffering. It just is overrated. Um, and I often tell people, and in, this, in academia, I can tell you guys, no dismissal of academia, but this thing of being the most pitiful. <laughs> I told faculty members, do not come in my office and claim to be the most pitiful. They're, I'm not given an award for that. You know, I don't believe in it. So for me, and everybody's different, for me, making sure that I have fun, that I get to enjoy my colleagues at work. I'm spending a lot of time at work. I should enjoy my colleagues. I should find out what about them is interesting uh, that I can learn from and I can enjoy. Um, I really like sports. I, I really enjoy being with my husband. I like my family and spend time with my family. But just deciding that life's gonna be fun and that if there's ever a week or a month where it's not, that it starts with me making sure it is. And I tell my colleagues at the Gates Foundation, because we're all into it and we overdo, we are serial overdoers, um, self-manage. Nobody's gonna understand as well as you do how much sleep you need, how much fun you need, how much exercise you need, what you should eat, who you should surround yourself with. So manage yourself so that you can be happy. Um, and I think if there's any one thing that I've tried to do, and I'm not always successful in doing it, it's to manage myself um, so that I enjoy life. And I can show up better if I do that. Um, and, and that's been really good self-advice, and I'm trying to take it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Sue. So we're going to now um, turn things over to the audience for Q&A. We've got some mics that are gonna be passed around on this first level. If you could raise your hand and keep your hand raised, um, once you get the mic, uh, please stand up and share your name and affiliation before stating your question. We also uh, have a, a uh, hashtag that you can use in order to tweet your questions, which we'll also be taking. That's a good option for those of you who are in the balcony. Um, so that hashtag is hashtag GSB BFTT. And we'll start with um, a question over here, please. Well, thank you so much. Marcello Palazzi, I'm a DCI fellow here and founder of the B Corps, which is a group of uh, progressive companies around the world. We're big fans of your foundation. Actually, one of the foundations I'm involved, Talbot Foundation, gave an award to Melinda Foundation last year. Uh, so, but I have a question. Uh, we in Europe, we see your foundation as a kind of model of what uh, a US foundation can be. And sometimes the question is, you seem to be very focused on health. and and health, and given that many of the challenges in the world are systemic, we just wonder whether you've had discussion, you have discussion about this sort of dilemma, being too focused versus being more of a generalist, uh, because actually that's also a tradition of many US foundations. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So the foundation has, um, has a focus on global health, global development that includes agriculture, financial services for the poor, um, some of the areas that, that are broader beyond health. Um, and in the US, our primary focus is on US education. Um, the foundation is always asking ourselves about the scope of our work and where we spend our time and energy and our funds. And we often have small projects that are going on to assess whether we should go into other areas and, and more broad. One of the really positive aspects about the focus on global health as an example, and I think why the Gates Foundation originally went down that road is, it's really clear what the global burden of disease is, and one can make very crisp decisions to use global burden of disease as your metric for what you're gonna tackle. There's a clarity of that and a really clear purpose of doing that so that we can have metrics both for success and about what we tackle, um, when we look in some other areas, we always ask, does the foundation have a unique opportunity to contribute? And we'll be, be able to measure and know if our efforts are making a difference. Some of the most important things we're asked about don't have those attributes that are as easy to track or measure, and yet we continue to push ourselves to ask that question. We have a question from Twitter. Yep, uh, this is from a first year MBA. Daniel Burroughs, he asks, um, you say the Gates Foundation is the biggest in the world, but is it big enough for its objectives? Yes, if. So we're big enough to meet our objectives if we think of our funds and um, our resources, which include the people's time and energy at the foundation as leverage. And so it's not uncommon for the foundation to be involved in an effort. Uh, the uh, Global Alliance for Vaccines Initiative is a good example um, that are going to raise more than $7 billion to bring vaccines to the world's poorest people. That involves a global effort on global vaccination, on low price accessible vaccines. Our efforts are magnified by the leverage we get when others come in. So I think our ambitions are not too large if we think of our efforts as bringing others in and the leverage you get from the foundation's uh, investments. Uh, I'm sorry, who has the mic? Uh, hi, my name is Austin. Um, I had a question that kind of piggybacking off the, you know, the response you gave to the first question when you said that um, there are a lot of issues that are very difficult to measure outcomes for and you're grappling with kind of how to address that. I was curious as to your thoughts on, do you think that all beneficial or positive outcomes that you're looking for are eventually measurable? Um, and if not, how do you think about making change in arenas where the outcome we're looking for may never be fully and accurately measured? That's it. It's the, the direct answer to your question is no. I think there are important things we care about and should care about that can't be measured. And that, that brings a dilemma. 
um, is one of the things that I think is important to recognize if you're in the not-for-profit world is you, you have to do better than good intentions, right? Good intentions don't change the world by themselves. So I would be open to thinking about something that can't have really clear, measurable outcomes like number of kids vaccinated, number of, of people whose lives were saved because they didn't get measles, for example. Those are really, you know, as a physician, I, I got that, right? Poverty. Poverty is measurable, how much money a family has. Poverty is a measurable outcome. If you start to focus on poverty, you have to look long term. But there are some metrics that can be associated with that. Um, uh, social justice is another thing that can start to get into things. Of how do you know that you've got social justice? What would be most important to me is that there's some way to know your investments are moving some needle. Um, so I think that there, there are maybe metrics that could be used that can start to get at it and get a sense for if you're changing outcomes that you care about. Um, but, but what would make me unhappy is if we got into an area where we really had no clue. I just don't see us doing that um, because the chance to fritter away capital that could be used on something where we can measure outcomes would just be too high. Do we have a question from this side? Um, in speaking with um, your predecessor, the Gates Foundation, Jeff Brakes, he mentioned um, a wide variety of people who work in, in the foundation world, so kind of nonprofit types who are passionate about social justice, academics who want to learn how to measure impact you know, with a lot of precision, and private sector types who kind of just want to get things done. And all, all three of those types seem to be part of your career background. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, what do you think you bring most to your job leading the foundation? And do you think the balance is right? Do you think that those disparate voices are leading to truth? Or are you trying to steer the foundation in, in one of those directions more than the others? I think it's great to have um, people involved in the foundation world who come from a variety of backgrounds and sectors. I think that's helpful and, and healthy. Um, what I, and I do think the mix generates good outcomes. What, what I would um, focus on is, is a couple of things that I think need to be balanced. What we've seen in the philanthropic world is a lot of people who have been successful in the private sector come into the not-for-profit world, and there's been a little bit of a culture clash. And that's why I say this, this question of we know good when we see it and good intentions have been sort of traditional in the not-for-profit sector, or we're underfunded and undersalaried and under a lot of things, so don't expect too much. That it can feel like that in the not-for-profit sector. And so I think bringing accountability, resources, talent, upping the ante is a really healthy thing. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's a valid criticism of a lot of newcomers to philanthropy, and I would put myself on that list, that we can bring a certain naivete. And the naivete is bringing Western solutions or a Western way of thinking or a very techie way of thinking to problems that would be solved if you actually sat down with a woman in a village and she could tell you why she can't get water because it's something simple that you tried to fix with a complex solution. Um, and so I think that the, the, the combination of bringing the, those resources, that talent, that passion, that accountability with with the humility to understand that on the ground in a different culture, you really don't know, and everything's a collaboration. Um, I think that combination can generate something that can be very positive. That and the last thing I'll say on that is, the, um, as impatient as I am, I do think the most important great philanthropic outcomes are measured in years, not months. Thank you. I'll take a question from Twitter, but I also do want to say, please make sure to state your name and affiliation when we call on you. Thank you. So this is from Sharon. Uh, she wants to know, you, you mentioned at the beginning about ways to motivate people and get them to provide clear answers and take risks. What kind of behaviors don't you reward or, or do you discourage? Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, to give a short answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Some of my least favorite, um, uh, probably my very least favorite is, it wasn't me. 
that guy's the reason that failed. If not for him or his function or his people, we'd be in a, a different and better place. That's really high on my list uh, of, of uh, an answer not to give. Um, the, the other one is, is that w we worked with a partner and you know they saw it this way and that's because they're stupid, not they disagreed with us or they come at it from a different point of view or have a different experience is to, to underestimate either a partner or a different function. I love teamwork, and, and one of the great things I was thrown into when I worked at Bristol-Myers Squibb is I got on a team when I worked on Taxol with manufacturing and sales and regulatory and, and all these people who had no idea what they did, but I came really quickly to understand none of the great stuff I wanted to have happen would happen without them. And so, um, the fact that I didn't know what sales and marketing did was me being ignorant, not them having value. And, and I think that's, that's the very important thing, particularly for technical people, scientists, physicians, is not to overestimate the fact that because you know science or IT or something, that, you, that extends into knowing everything. So that would be on the list too. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a question from this way? Hi, I'm Roz Naylor. I direct the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford and a professor of environmental earth system science. I really enjoyed the interview on both your parts. It's really wonderful. Um, I had a question about um, coming into a large organization where you have an incredible global health program, agricultural development program, education program. And at one level, you've got such talented people, you want to just um, give the best incentives and let those uh, divisions really take off. Um, yet at the intersection of those different divisions might be the most creative solutions. For example, a number of the global health issues may really be dependent on much better nutrition or the ending of malnutrition in those areas. Um, Similarly, the best advances in agricultural development may be the solving of some of the productivity, depleting uh, disease issues. How do you motivate really um, good creativity and productivity at the intersections um, when, when you really need some disciplinary strength as well? That is so hard to do, I can tell you. that the, It's one of the biggest challenges. I'll give you two ways that I've started to think about this. One is geography. So we can take advantage of the fact that we have multiple programs going on in certain geographies like Northern India, like Ethiopia, and we have what's called a tech panel where we bring together in the geography all of the various silos in the foundation who are working on different aspects of problems. It may be nutrition, family planning, uh, vaccination, and agriculture, but all being done in Ethiopia. So bringing together those folks so that they know what each other are doing um, and coordinate through our country offices and through that geography can start to help us connect those docs and look across. The other thing that I'm trying to do at the foundation is have a very strong executive leadership team. It, we can't expect people in the trenches to collaborate if the executive leadership team isn't collaborating. And I think in the foundation, in our foundation, we've expected the executive leadership team to focus a lot on business process and less on strategy. I'm trying to turn that on its head and have a much more strategic focus on the executive leadership team and look at those intersections um, including the executive leadership team showing up in pairs in geographies and at the foundation so that we can start connecting at our level. Oh, we'll take this question in the middle. Good afternoon. Um, I'm an MBA One student. Um, to continue somewhat with uh, Professor Naylor's question, um, how do you balance the funding, the, um, funding of new technology versus the implementation of a specific technology in a sector? And then Assuming that that varies by, by sector, um, does this have implications for how businesses should consider opportunities? There's, there's not a neat and tidy answer to your question. So, so I, I will tell you the, the, um, the way I start to think about this is um, there are times when delivery as you call it, they're sort of making the existing tools reach where they need to reach. Um, makes good sense. Uh, often at scale, that's the job of the Ministry of Health, for example, or the Ministry of Agriculture. So, so for me, the delivery aspect of what we do has to be very clear, often involve an innovation, 
or a, a pilot or trying to do something that then can be scaled because we're never going to deliver on a global basis. Um, that's, that's for others to do that. So we have to be extremely purposeful with our delivery methods and, and be thoughtful about what that looks like and how we make that real. Um, so that often involves delivery innovation. So really important that delivery innovation is a part of what we do. On the technology side, we, we have an affinity and I have an affinity for technology solutions, but I look at technology solutions through a really clear lens. And that is, is will this really change things? So um, I was involved in a discussion yesterday about cervical cancer. Screening for cervical cancer and preventing cervical cancer is really hard at scale. It involves women who are 35 to 50, a little older than typical use the healthcare system in a low resource country. And you have to see many, many women um, before you can truly prevent cancer. So if we had a diagnostic that looks at oncogenic uh, papillomavirus, if, if we had something that really was, was transformative in saying all these women don't need this expensive, hard to execute screening, that would be a transformative diagnostic. That's the kind of thing I want to fund. So often the best discussions I'm involved in talk about delivery, talk about a missing technology, and the likelihood that we can provide something that transforms that delivery that the ministry, the government, others are providing because everything's easier after that. That's where I think we're at our finest. Given the limited time uh, remaining, I want to conclude with a question, Sue, that is near and dear to many of us in the audience. What matters most to you and why? What matters most to me is that the, as a leader, I can allow for really talented people um, to do things that improve um, people's chance at a happy life. Um, the reason for me is, and it kind of gets back to how I was raised and the environment I was in, just I became a physician because I really wanted and want to think that, um, uh, you know, to, to the, the Gates Foundation motto is all lives have equal value. So that everybody has a chance to be healthy and happy and have a, the life they'd like for themselves and their families. And so thinking about how, um, you know, when I was a doctor and interacted with a patient one at a time, I cared so deeply that that patient would have a good experience. And when I left the general practice of medicine and moved as a leader, my hope is that many more patients and many more people will have a chance to have the kind of life I hope for them. Um, and that the really talented people I get to work with are inspired and have that passion and oomph and drive to create those things and that I helped. Well, thank you so much for your insights and your candor and we can't wait to see how you continue to improve the world. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.